Thank you very much. So I think those of you in the front row are about to take their seats. So we'll invite uh, Mr. Nipometo, the winner of the Goy Peace Award, as well as our guest, Mr. Haru Miyagi. And together with Chairperson Masami Sayonji, we would like to have a discussion of various points. Uh, the topic will be Our Paradigms Are Shifting. The moderator will be served by President Hiro Sayonji. We'd like to ask all the panelists to join us on the stage. Could we have a warm applause for our panelists, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, President Hiro Sayonji. We'd like to turn over to you. Oh, thank you very much. We'd like to start part two, talk session. Our paradigms are shifting. Let us go on to this part of the program. So I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists on the podium, on the stage, rather. Uh, the winner of the Goy Peace Prize winner, uh, Mr. Mikumita. Thank you very much for joining us again. Next to him is the head of ETIC, NPO, Mr. Haru Miyagi. As for Mr. Miyagi, while well, he was at Wasser University, he created, ed, uh, he created ETIC, a network of uh, social entrepreneurs. And in 2000, he set up an NPO, and he became the head of that NPO. And he also has Accession, which is a social entrepreneurship program. And up until now, I understand that more than 1,000 social entrepreneurs have been uh, generated as a result of this initiative. And in 2011, at yeah, the World Economic Forum, at the so-called Davos Forum, the young, he was one of the, you were invited to take part in the young, uh, elected as one of the young global leaders. And also, he's the advisor to the Minister of Education. He's also a member of the advisory council. So, Mr. Miyagi, we look forward to your time for this session. And thank you for joining us today, Mr. Miyagi. And we're also joined by the chairperson, uh, Ms. Masami Sayonji, of the Boy Peace Foundation. So, I will be serving as the coordinator of this uh, panel discussion, and uh, st we'll start the talk session. And, of course, my name is Hiro Masayonji, uh, the president of uh, the Algoi Peace Foundation. Thank you. So, with regard to Mr. Nipometa, we've already heard from him, and I think we have a very good understanding of, of what his message is. But as for the, our other guest, Mr. Haru Miyagi, perhaps we could invite him to talk a little bit, Mr. Miyagi. Since you were a student, I'm even involved in training social entrepreneurs. So what were your thoughts when you began this initiative? What was the, what led you to where you are today? What, what was the starting point? And also with regard to the concrete uh, activities. Maybe you could spend the first six or s s uh, six or seven minutes uh, about what you do, Mr. Miyagi. Thank you very much for that introduction. First and foremost, I was inspired by the young youngster's speech and also by Nippon's uh, speech. I'm my stomach is full. I feel full. I'm so grateful for this opportunity and this invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, around summer this year. The, peace, uh, the Goy Peace Foundation uh, approached us, and I was inspired by their introduction of Nippon's uh, activities. And I visited him in Berkeley just the other day. The message that I think he gave us a message that all the Japanese people need today. Next year, we'll have the Tokyo Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games next year. And I will, I'm involved in that. And I do hope that uh, Nippon's message could be reflected in the Olympic Games next year. That is my wish, that is my wish. So, 
I'm, I, I, I hope that we can do something officially as well as through the private sector channels. Now, let me talk about myself. As was already introduced by the coordinator, when I was uh, when I was a sophomore uh, in the university, at the age of 20, I began this activity. This was 1993, by the, by the way. Back then, there was no term social entrepreneur. That word didn't exist back then. And also, even the lifestyle of entrepreneurship, very few people chose to be entrepreneurs back then. It was not an option for many university, university students back then, because no one taught you about entrepreneurship back then. And we thought that uh, this was a very um, this was a very difficult uh, road to proceed. To proceed, it's in, it's the case now. It was uh, the case back then. So after graduation, I could never I could never envision setting up my own business and going going into my own business. But then it just so happens that uh, I began this uh, I began this initiative. My father's generation, my grandfather's generation, I would say them. They would, their sense of happiness, their sense of achievement, and my sense of achievement were totally at odds. That's what I began to recognize. So, as far as I'm concerned, I really couldn't envision any type of job that I wanted to be involved in. That was back in high school. I had no vision as to what I wanted to be in the future. And I really didn't think that the conventional, that nothing in the conventional community presented me with such an idea. But then I went to the university. Then I came across the notion of entrepreneurship in my in, at the university. I thought that if, the, if it did not exist, why not create something on our own? I, I want to communicate that there's a, there is such a challenge. You don't all need to be entrepreneurs. But why not pave your own way? What is it, what is, if there's something that's valuable to you, then it's important that you incorporate those values in your lifestyle. I went, I, just knowing that that option is out there, just knowing that, I think will give you hope. For example, the term entrepreneurship, I believe that this is something that anyone can have. For example, even if you're working in an office, even if you're working for a company or a government office, it's imp you can have the mentality of an entrepreneur. You can tackle challenges with the mentality of an entrepreneur. And. Uh, I'm supporting the training program at the National Personnel Authority, a government agency. I love them, as a matter of fact. Why? Because their aspirations are very closely aligned to the aspirations of a social entrepreneur. It's just that the expressions are different, perhaps, but the aspirations are the same. So they're civil servants. But I think even civil servants can be entrepreneurship in their mentality. Two days from now, Nippon, Nip, uh, Nippon will give an, um, a lecture, and the members of the National Personal Authority will be coming to your lecture. Yeah, I'm hoping that we can incorporate your philosophy into the, into the training program for the civil servants at the National Personal Authority. Now, back in the 1990s, communicating about entrepreneurship was a challenge on its own, because someone thought about entrepreneurship during the 1990s, so even communicating that was a challenge. So. Back then, so Masayoshi Son, the head of SoftBank, was unknown back then. He was a signing figure, but he was not well known in the community. So I would invite Masayoshi Son, the head of SoftBank, to campuses so that the students will know that there are other, op other, other options out there. Then internet came along, and IT ventures began to crop up. And here in Japan, at last, going into one's own business became one viable option for the youngsters at that time. So back in the late 90s, people began to have that awareness. So, so venture, venture business primarily on IT. That social ecosystem began to be prepared at that time as well here in Japan. As for myself, being successful in a venture does not represent happiness. Just because you're a successful venture venture business doesn't mean that you are happy. That doesn't mean that you're happy. But being able to express one's values, I wanted to support people in expressing their values, living their values. That's why I focused on the notion of social entrepreneurship, trying to solve social issues through entrepreneurship. That's what I that's what I value. So having heard. Nippon's uh, communicate, uh, lecture today, being gentle, being kind, can translate into tackling on new challenges. So that type of living, I think 
there are a lot of there are a lot of youngsters and also people in my generation who want to live that way. We all want to live like that. But the term social entrepreneurship, it's now well known here in the community. But back then, there was no such word. This word didn't exist back then. So, through by setting up one's own business and by becoming a one by becoming a leader of one business and and and, and uh, addressing social challenges, that type of term did not exist back then. But then, around the year 2000. I began to focus on supporting social entrepreneurs, and it's been 20 years since then. And actually, in, from 2011, I was also involved with the reconstruction of the earthquake in Hokkaido. And in the 1990s, the, among IT measures that started, uh, I have a lot of friends who are successful and became uh, uh, millionaires. I have always been an PO, so nothing has changed in my case. But my friends who were interns, who are students, now are uh, executives of large IT businesses now. And they are very rich now. But now, after the earthquake disaster, they made a lot of donations. And that created a new circulation in Japan. So that is all for the moment. Thank you very much. The Goi Peace Foundation was established in 1999, as I mentioned. This is the 20th anniversary this year. And Nippon started his service space also in 1999, right? And you are also celebrating the 20th anniversary. Miyagi-san's activities also started around the same time. So it's a coincidence, but the three groups, this is a 20th anniversary talk session of the three groups. Now, uh, I'd like to ask the chairperson. Well, actually, we have known uh, Nippon for quite a long time. We are very good friends. Now, finally, he was able to get the Goi Peace Awards this year. I'm very happy for that. So, uh, Chairperson, could you introduce uh, his, uh, how uh, you are friends with Nippon and your impression about his work? So, I'm getting quite old. So, when I listen to such talks about among young people, I feel that it's now time for me to withdraw from such a forum. Young people like uh, Miyagi-san, Nippun, their talks. It's just like my three children. My three children are so passionate about you, so they forget about me. I feel jealous about it. I'm sure they're trying to do something new. And actually, how should I say? Thanks to you, I think my children could grow into adults. But before that, in the essay contest, the we'll winner, Victor and Ilya, those essays were very good, reflecting your souls. I was very moved with that. So through such great essays, which I felt a joy in my heart, now and the current day, we are now finally able to know uh, what it means. How many people uh, entered? Yes, 20,000 people entered and to the essay contest, and I only read the translated version, but by reading all those who remain to the finals, they were all so good. I wanted to award them all. So the young people are living in entirely different era than us. They are new journals, new way of living. Until now, there were teachers, instructor, instructors, and there were top IT presidents. That is one way of moving forward. There are different selections. There are different options about what education you want to get. And people may want to make a lot of money, have high positions, uh, have a power. That was taken for granted on my days. So potentially, we always stand 
to be controlled by this way of living. So maybe my mind was rotten with this old way of thinking, but the new era, new entrepreneurs are too busy. Uh, um, but for instance, the concept of leadership, I understand that, but leadership, ladder is a ladder. But, but when I ask children to explain what that means, I finally understand what it means. Based on the education or concept that I had so far, ladder means that everyone is on the equal basis, equal footing, and people must go up the ladder. So people who go to high positions, aren't they using the ladder to go up? That was my impression. But are they trying to do something good for others? Are they trying to get power and position going up the ladder to be able to help others? But I was told, no, it's entirely different. Then uh, take me with you, but uh, people couldn't explain to me because they were busy. But uh, by listening to your presentation, what is leadership? How remarkable it is and what Miyagi-san is doing, that you have always been doing what you can do on a steady basis. So the world, the balance is shifting and there, uh, there are many conflicts among the presidents in the world, but that is something that the general uh, people cannot uh, get into. So how is it that the presidents, leaders, religions, without depending on such leaders, how can each individual use the ladder to be kind to others. The education until now was based on knowledge rather than love. That is why people had to study hard to get to universities, and there is a competition to get into university. So rather than love, to be successful, was important. Everyone tried hard uh, to be successful, but removing all that to do whatever you want to do and to be kind to others, to be grateful, thankful to others. If we can make such a world, we can have a lot of hope and dream about our future. So I st I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, I hope I can see what will happen in the future. So there's a lot of young people in the world. Nippon talked so much, uh, which is so impressive. I was very impressed. And what Miyagi uh, did was also impressive. So we are working so hard. So I think the world is changing, and the way we are living must change. So things are changing. So we must follow the young people or children uh, to learn from them, and we must be modest to follow what they are doing. And by doing so, I hope we can learn from you what we can do. Even an old woman like me, I think we can do that. If you tell me how to do it, I can do that. Well, Nippon. I think that is a one of the concepts of leadership. And in your lecture, based on the lectures that you have mentioned, I would like to ask further questions. So far, voluntary activities, philanthropy existed in the world, but the service space activities seems to be coming from a different way of thinking. Nippon, analyzing by yourself, what do you think is a major difference compared to the conventional philanthropic activities or volunteer activities? What do you think is most important in your activities or your philosophy or principle? Could you let me know?
Um, I think a large part of the nonprofit world is uh, very rooted in impact, and impact is important. Uh, but if it just becomes one-dimensional uh, external change, then you actually forget about the inner transformation. So I think the key distinction is how do you create external change while leading with inner change? I have had the privilege of knowing some incredible social entrepreneurs, um, and uh, you know the ones that I end up admiring are not the ones that create the most number of things on the outside. Uh, they're actually those who do that, but also change themselves. So one of, uh, someone I really looked up to was an inspiration in India. He revolutionized sanitation in the country. And he himself, his organization built, uh, you know, 100, I, I think uh, 500,000 toilets, uh, which was a real human rights issue. Uh, because it, it changes so much. Um, and he started more than 100 organizations. He received the highest of awards uh, across the country. And he passed away a few years ago. And at his funeral, lots of people were there. They had to shut down entire streets. And you had very famous dignitaries from the country to the humblest janitors come, and everyone gives these speeches, and appreciating him. It was at his funeral. And then his wife goes last, and his wife says, all of you know all the things he has done, but let me tell you why I think my husband was amazing, is because it wasn't just, he wasn't just what he did, it was who he was becoming. Here was a man that I've been married to for decades, and never once did he get angry with me. So here was a guy that did external stuff, but it wasn't just doing the external things. He, was, he realized that we need to change ourselves through it, and as we change ourselves, it affects how we create ripples in, in the world. And I think that element of inner change leading to outer change is a very different process than starting with outer change and then figuring that at some point you will get to inner change. So I think it creates very different patterns. If it's just inner change alone, that's not enough. You know, I do think that spiritual people need to get active, and, but active people also need to get spiritual. So it works both ways, but as you lead from inside out, I think you create very different kind of change, and it shows up in the designs that you create. And I think service space is one example of that, where we stress this idea of being the change, um, but not just because it's a nice thing to do, because it actually affects collective flow, collective intelligence, and the innovations that you create. They're very, very different. And this is something that I have learned. I didn't know this starting, but now I see this giant field of people that are moved by inner transformation, but also care to create external change. And the kind of wisdom that's in that circle is just very different. Um, so I think that's a very core distinction. Hello. Well, in, in Nippon's speech, he talked about how he was a full-time volunteer at a very young age. And a very simple thought on our part. You're just giving. How do you make a living? That is a question many people will have. I'm not putting, putting aside the individual, but this activity doesn't generate uh, revenues. So how, so how is that sustainable? How can you make that sustainable? What's the key secret? There are many people who have such questions. So if you could share that secret with us, thank you. We, we all know the secret because when we were in our mother's wombs, we didn't have a plan and we all survived. Um, and in some sense, the principle is that if you are, when you give, there is a ripple effect. There is an external ripple effect and there is an inner ripple effect. And it creates, the external ripple effect creates relationships. 
and over time, and the inner ripple effects changes your identity. So you start to expand who you are. Over time, when you bring both of those things together, you actually ha have a cocoon of relationships. So the onus of your survival is no longer on the shoulders of your ego. And so a lot of people say, "How? oh my God, that's amazing. How do you survive? My question to them is, oh my God, it's amazing. You have so much faith in your bank balance? You have so much faith in your ego? <laughs> and we do, right? We're like, yeah, I'm so smart. I have done so much. And now I, that will give me... A, and where do we learn this? Because it's nowhere in nature. Birds don't have bank accounts, right? This is not how our, you know, my mom is right here in the front row. She didn't say, I'm gonna give you nine months of free labor and then in return, you will do this for me, right? It, it doesn't, inside our bodies, we don't have that kind of transaction. So where are we getting this idea, this story, that the onus of our survival is on our egos, and where are we getting this idea that our security will come from accumulation? And where are we getting this idea that the best way to get ahead is to be transactional? I, I, I think it's a very, so I actually have the opposite question and say, wow, it's amazing that you believe so much in the strength of your ego. How many, a remarkable, successful business people, and I have met so many of them, if you really sit down and have a candid conversation with them, and you say, do you really think you did this? We overestimate our effort, and we underestimate grace. And I think that as I have grown through life, I have realized that actually Man, so much of life is unearned blessings. Like, how, how do you meet the people that you meet, which ends up creating all these ripple effects? And we tend to put all that onus into our limited intelligence on the shoulders of our ego, and that's actually exhausting. So my, you know, the, the answer really is that you give, it, to give is to be related, and if you have a web of these relationships, you would be amazed by the natural law of the universe. Someone's cup of gratitude somewhere will overflow. My wife and I went on a walking pilgrimage when we tested this. We walked across India and we said, we'll eat whatever food is offered, sleep wherever place is offered, and how would you survive? Who will take care of you? Your job is just to give, but in giving, you get related, and as you get related, you are able, you, you are taken care of. People do take care of you. Uh, it's a universal law. Well, that is because I think you, you are so convincing because you've experienced that. Now, Mr. Miyagi, we, t we talk about social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs have to generate revenue. They have to be socially active. I think because they're involved in social business. Now, having heard Niven's comments, what are your thoughts? What, what is your impression? You know, that's a, a frequently asked question, frequently asked question, actually. In my case, well, I think there I think that I provide indirect assistance so that uh, these activities can be so sustainable. But my impression is also this. In the case of Niven's, and I really sympathize and I identify with what Niven mentioned, Niven mentioned, young people today, their value, young people don't value money that much now. I mean, it's not that they don't sense value in money, but they sense that money is only one of the values in terms of richness. And that type of uh, perception is spreading at a very fast speed. Every year I see this, and every year I get the sense that the p young people's values are changing. And I had the chance to talk to the members of Goy Peace Foundation. We heard, and I'm hoping, and we talked with members of the Goy Peace Foundation that the young people in Japan who can actually succeed in Nippon's philosophy. 
because I teach uh, Japanese university students. I interviewed some of the students. Let me, sh let me show you a slide uh, that shows the results of the interview with the young people in Japan. It's just the work in progress. So let me briefly introduce you to she. When she was in university, she was uh, participating in the activity of supporting the refugees. Refugee support is an area that is not still well understood in Japan, and Japan as a nation, uh, the measures taken by the government all, is also not sufficient. And there's an NPO was started, and she started her activities. But the companies are not yet supportive, and funding is also fundraising is difficult. There are many measures are taken, but actually she. I think there is 40 or 50,000 yen uh, as a support money provided to refugees, and she decided to experiment that. So for two years. Uh, she uh, decided to challenge and make her living using the same amount for two years. One reason is that uh, her activity is not profitable, but she also wanted to experiment how you can make a living with that amount of money. So I think she was very brave in trying to do so, and she's still ongoing that experiment. So she says, uh, we talk about the north wind and the uh, sun. And so she thought we had to fight against the northern wind, but that was not right. Get in touch with the refugees. She thought that there, is, there are diverse values. To have diverse values, she thought that is a sign of richness. And that is a value that should be communicated in Japan. That is how she started her activities, and she started to um, introduce uh, people um, for work as a recruiting activity. So her approach is very fair. She's not trying to provide help to the refugees from the top down, but she wants to communicate the attractiveness uh, and because she believes it's a benefit for both. And there was an impressive case that she encountered in Iran Women itself cannot enjoy music, cannot enjoy fashion, because that is a reason to be arrested. But there was a girl who was passionate about the singing, and she was very impressed by her song. So, so uh, she believes we must create a society where everyone can show their energy. Another, another example that I'd like to introduce is he, Mr. Kawamoto. He's a student of the medical department of Tokyo University. So he's at the top most difficult university in Japan. And of course, his parents uh, want him to become a doctor. But he entered into this uh, unpredictable world. He went to Bangladesh. He look at the mountain of waste and get in touch with the local people. He tried to think of ways uh, that he could help. And he wanted to make use of his area of expertise. And, and he uses some small uh, insects uh, and use such insects to decompose uh, house garbage. So this insect is, uh, his room is full of this insect, and he's trying to uh, develop that technology. So he also, he didn't feel obliged to sacrifice himself to help the people of Bangladesh, but it was very natural for him to try to do something that could help them and he wants to make this a theme for his life. And these people, actually, uh, I feel that the, the a lot of people like him, and, but there are not so many role models. There are not so many opportunities to learn from others. So what happens is that such people start uh, 
to uh, drop off from schools. They don't go to school because the sense of values that they have is different from what the schools are teaching. So they find it meaningless to go to school and they res resist going to school. So from the parents' perspective, they are worried about their child. But actually, these people can create a lot of difference. They can challenge creating difference. So what I mean is that the current generation or future generation, as Nippon is saying, leadership, kindness could be born. Uh, children having that uh, concept from the very beginning could be born, but society is not yet able to provide support to them. So. We'll theme today's paradigm shift, but I think paradigm shift is already starting. We have an option. We are now at a stage of having an option to choose. And that is what I often feel when I look at the younger people. So we are always getting in touch with your younger generation and supporting them. So that is why I believe uh, you feel in that manner. Well, Nippon, you are also, you also have uh, important principles. You talk about a small act, start from small act. Why is it that not big acts, but you believe small acts are important? I, I, I will uh, get to that, but I also want to add a comment uh, to what Miyagi-san said. And I think there's a, there's a very easy bridge between what uh, Miyagi-san was saying and also what I was referring to and what we see in the younger generation, which is that we had this singular focus on money as capital. Wealth equals money. But money is just one form of wealth. There are multiple forms of wealth, meaning and purpose make a huge difference. So that woman, may, that's a young social entrepreneur, Care, it need, needs money, and I'm also not against money, but, ha, but they care for alternate forms of capital uh, as well, a, a, as a sort of metric. And to go to your question about uh, why small, because small is more likely to be related. If you are big, you are going to create incredible inequities. You're going to create, you know, I have, you don't have. No matter which capital you are, if it's small, you're actually saying everyone can give. Everyone can be great because everyone can give in their own way. Now, you may have money, I may not have money. He may have fame, I'm, I may not have fame. But maybe I have creativity, right? Maybe I have unique circumstances that allow me to do something. So if the orientation is small, it invites everyone to the party. And as we get more people uh, engaged, you actually create relationship capital. And that relationship capital is the sum of it is greater than, uh, or rather the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So you really create a new intelligence uh, as a base on, on that basis. And that's why I think small is actually an invitation for everyone to join uh, the festival of love. Yes, it is right. Yes, I remember you mentioned that rather than one person donating one million dollars, one million people donating one dollar will create a bigger movement. Of course, the heart is related to human energy. And uh, capital, which is not money, will be invested. So it has a bigger influence. And uh, to start from small, that is what the chairperson always says. Do you have anything about it? Yes. Uh, the younger people uh, understand immediately what I have difficulty understanding. But letting that aside, in the essay contest, let me talk about essay contest, but, uh, but uh, to read all the uh, finalists for the essay contest, uh, each one was very good about uh, talking about what they can do for others coming from poor countries. 
these children don't write about money or uh, growth or power, but they all, all talk about power. They all talk about money, uh, not about money, but about love. So the parents uh, are raising children, and there's a potential among the parents about the power, success, uh, money, or to be awarded of something. But rather than that, uh, the children are looking at uh, things closer to them, like their friends, uh, people bullying at schools. Uh, uh, children need a lot of generosity. They talk about the, that to the parents. So they're struggling inside the house, and there's no solution. There's such situation plenty here in Japan. So in the case of children, if they can talk to their friends, that type of uh, problem can be solved. So such small acts, anyone can take small acts, even without money, without title. Even if you're not smart, you can do small acts. All it takes is a bit of imagination and just a bit of talent. You can actually draw out the hidden talent. That type of school education is necessary because the education right now, I wouldn't rule it out. But we need to change the current school education. That is where we are. So it's so good to hear such wonderful experiments of the young people. Not just ideals, but actual experiment. And also through the essay contest, we heard about the struggles that people have. But they, but we saw how these applicants do small acts for their families and how that has created joy. So there are a lot of children out there who are acting. They have already experienced. So it, we can do. It is doable. The future is up to you. So please bear the responsibility for a bright future. It's like it's like a press conference for your retirement. It sounds like. So Nippon, you were an IT expert for a very long time. You're an ex IT expert. So through online, you also were involved in volunteer activities in the beginning. But on the other hand, you're also involved in offline relations between individuals on offline basis as well. So you do this both on parallel. And one typical example of that is the Awakens Circle. I think there's a story, right? You you shared with us a story about the Awaken Circle. If there's other interesting anecdotes, I would appreciate hearing about the Awaken Circle. Um, I, to bridge it to what Masami-san was also saying, they did this. I think one of the biggest issues that we have in our times is connection. That we are disconnected with the systems and nature. We're disconnected with uh, each other and we're disconnected with ourselves. So they asked young people, if you had to give up one of these three things, what would you give up? Your cell phone, your internet access, or your sense of taste? And 72% chose sense of taste. And we look at that and we say, wow, I can't understand that. But actually, if you put yourself in their shoes, you would understand because even more than a sense of taste, we care for a sense of connection. And the only way you know how to connect is through your phone and your internet access. And so we have this crisis of connection. Um, and in that context, what my parents have been doing uh, in our own home, just it's such a humble thing. It's so simple. They're saying, I mean, talk about multiple forms of capital. They're saying, we're going to give you space. No one's going to call you a philanthropist of the year by saying, I'm going to give you space. But the space is you move your couches to the side and you say, now we can sit in silence. We can be with each other. We can listen to each other. And then, yeah, we'll share a meal together. And, and no donation box, no agenda, like there's no way for, there's just no commercialization. And you would think, well, what's the power of that? And a lot of times when people will come and they will say, thank you, what can I do for you? And they will say, no, you go and do something for somebody else. But what they're pointing to is something Maybe we should call upon your father and mother. We need to hear the mother and father. Parents, your parents should come up to the stage. The parents should come up to the stage. So the, the parents, please, could we invite the parents to the stage? OK, then we'll listen to their voice. Yes, sorry. No, you can stay, but we'll give you the microphone. We'll give you a microphone. 
But can you please stand and show your face? Please stand and show your face. 22 years, every week, every week, every Wednesday, they would open their house and uh, provide access to anyone. And they would provide meals free of charge. 22 years, 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. This, they are the starting point. A wonderful story. A wonderful story. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I, I will, I will be hero, and I will interview you for uh, may, maybe just one or two minutes. But can you share a moment uh, of how of something around an awakened circle, a story? Uh, that really moved you and changed you. Because one of the things that I was saying was that you, we give usually with direct reciprocity. I give to you, what are you giving back to me? Even if I give you money, I say, what's the impact of this? Then we learn about indirect reciprocity. I give to you, you give to this person, and what goes around comes around. I can still see it. But what they do is infinite reciprocity. So they say that I give to you, and you give it somewhere in the world, wherever you're moved. And because we're fundamentally interconnected, wherever that ripple of love goes, it will touch us. And so people living, it's very easy to find people living in direct reciprocity. What am I getting in return? With multiple forms of capital. It's little rare to find people who do indirect reciprocity. I care for my circle, but it's still my circle. It's much harder to find people who just say infinite reciprocity. And what's amazing about them is that they're everyday people. They're simple people. Um, and so I would invite you with that context to say something. Um. You can, you can tell I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> um, one thing that comes to mind, and um, we have shared um, quite a few times, was a while back, we were traveling in India, and I was very sick. And it was a two-day two train journey. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was... Um, the journey was through such a passage that food was going to be a problem. Um, and everybody was, was worried. They didn't want us to eat the food from the station. And um, it so happened that the lady who was sitting next to me, who, whose birth was next to mine, and my husband was also with, with, us, with me, um, she was the wife of the um, whole um, railway system. <clears throat> and uh, the word was out that she's traveling. So every station, people will come, bring the best home-cooked meal. And you know they would have the silverware, and they would set up the whole, whole thing within five or 10 minutes of uh, a train stopping. And then um, they would leave. But this lady was fasting. So she would say, please, <laughs> have the meal. <laughs> and that was, uh, for me, that was really an example of uh, how things, what goes around, comes around in one way or the other. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And anything that comes to mind? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to tell you the hidden um, things that happen in an awakened circle, because actually it's very difficult to uh, to understand that unless you experience it yourself. But I'll try to attempt to bring out some of the hidden uh, things that uh, go on. Uh, you know, meditating for one hour, then just sharing reflections. Uh, that doesn't really bring out the, a sense of uh, what happens. Basically, it is a co-creation of a space that is filled with love 
and the environment is so set by the effort of everyone so that people's heart open up and they share things that they would never think that they would share because now their their heart has opened up after one hour of meditation and the environment is so powerful uh, filled with love that they feel like sharing and because of that the next thing that happens is there is a healing force created a healing energy created and many people i have heard from uh, different circles they feel totally uh, impacted by that and uh, they will keep coming back again and again thank you <laughs> this beautiful thank you thank you so much ana gosai wa for more than 30 years Uh, about 23 years, I think their house is open and uh, they are providing meals to those who come, even poor people. So I wanted to introduce them to you. Thank you very much for coming to the stage. Yes, to hear the experience directly is very uh, convincing. Seeing is believing. And to experience by yourself is believing. To listen to the story is very impressive. Well, Nippon, uh, we are running out of time, but you started uh, with your four friends, the volunteer activity initially, but now there are 600,000 people participating now. A big circle of kindness have expanded to such a large organization. Why is it that this movement, this activity expanded so fast? What is the reason? So th in, the, in recent years, we have seen a lot of neuroscience that tells you that we are wired to be kind, that it makes us happier to be related to each other. It gives us resiliency if we have deep friendships. So I think we are living in a time where we're so fundamentally disconnected and the problems feel so complex that if you talk about nonviolence today, we have more to worry about with sugar than we do gunpowder. And you look across the board, there are more people dying of diabetes than starvation. And these are statistics that we all know. And so you look at that and you say, wow, like I don't know how to hold all of that. So I think fun, uh, underneath the sort of uh, the interest in service space, even apart from the members, it touches millions of folks every month, but underneath it, there's a hunger for people saying, how can, you know, how can we connect with this in an authentic way? And I think the distinction with something like service space is that there's so the three M's, as soon as you become big and successful in any way, the dominant paradigm comes in to try to box you in. And if you're not mindful, you would just look at that and you say, oh, Oprah wants to have us on TV, or the Skoll Foundation wants to give us a million dollars. And you think of that from an old paradigm perspective, and you say, that's great, that's appreciation, that's love underneath it, and there is some of that love, but it starts to trap you, because by the 15th year after that, you're, you've just got a massive fundraising department, and every single thing you do, there's like more cameras than people doing it. Um, and so I think there is a hung, it, not only is there a hunger because we are disconnected, but there is also a hunger of things that are operating outside the dominant paradigm because the dominant paradigm is creating a lot of these subversive problems. So our neurobiology, for example, wants us to go on Facebook and share the articles that we are moved by. They want us to share and be related with each other. And so it's tapping into that, but it's actually part of a larger system that is co-opting that impulse of our neurobiology to want to share 
and it's putting it under, you know, it's profiting the Facebooks of the world, which ultimately is actually creating a lot more problems for society than it's helping solve. So I think that A, we want to connect, but B, I think we want to also create new contexts where we're not just in the same dominant paradigm of, you know, uh, of, of the traditional forces uh, and say, how can we, and I, so I think service space is providing one example of that. It's a courageous example, but I think you need a whole series of these examples on a whole spectrum. I didn't say you just, you, you don't like money, you don't like power, you don't like fame. I think you have to balance that fame with deep cast. You have to balance the money with multiple forms of capital. You have to balance the sort of broadcast with the deep cast. Um, so I think it's in that spectrum and service space is on one end of the spectrum which starts the conversation. That we are not available for sale, we're not gonna put a price tag, and then you say, oh, how does that work? It raises a question mark, and it invites all of us to find our spot on the spectrum and say, I wanna create this change in this way. And many social entrepreneurs are doing that, uh, and I think we need a healthy spectrum. Right now, everything is on one side. So I think that's the hunger, that's the need, and that's the response that service space is playing, but I think we need like a million service spaces in the world. Um, Thank you very much. We have Mr. Miyagi. You have already developed more than 1,000 social entrepreneurs. And to expand such movement, what is necessary? What do you think is important? Well, I went to Berkeley to hear about it. And what Nippon is doing, I think, is very impressive. And at the same time, if you start in a good way, you don't need so much power. Already, the young people, I talked about the young people, but of course, they believe this is something that we already have inside ourselves. And the Nippon says that the people want to be connected, and that is right. So I don't think it's necessary to have a power to make a massive change. But I say the Olympics next year, I think, is very important. In 2011, we had the Great East Japan earthquake in Japan, and that caused a very big change in our mentality, our mindset. Uh, we st our activities are based on that, so Olympics is, is also one turning point. I think the behavior and the mindset of many people might change through the Olympics. And by providing such opportunities, I don't think it's difficult to change. So if I'm feeling that it's not difficult to change throughout my activities. Yes, actually, as you talked about Olympics, since we are going to have Olympics in Japan, instead of a commercial Olympic, I think we must go back to the basics, have Olympics that communicate about peace. Olympic must be a festival of peace. That is the value of Olympics. So in many ways, how can well, Olympic is a focus of attention of the world, and how can we communicate about peace through Olympics? We talk about legacy. Legacy is not only about the building of the roads, but legacy in our minds, in our heart. To keep peace in our heart is the largest legacy, so if there's anything that can help, I'd like to help you. Thank you. I was in Paris until two days ago. And uh, Paris will be the whole city for the 2024 Games. And they're strategically already considering the possible legacy after the Paris Games. And our proposal was very much aligned to what you mentioned. We want to leave behind a human legacy after the Games. So Tokyo in 2020 and 2024 in Paris. And then LA will, LA will follow in 2028. They should all be connected. So
that we can improve the society. Why not start a new movement connecting these three games? That's what we're considering. Yesterday, I came up with a thought. So in coinciding with the Olympic Games next year, maybe we can invite Nippon. We hope we can invite Nippon. And why not host an international conference next year, inviting Nippon? We could talk about, well, we could talk about actions to improve our society and to improve spirituality. Maybe we could communicate that message from Tokyo. It's just uh, a thought on my own. It's just my own thought. But I will invite you. No backing yet. No backing yet. But. And going, there's a lot that we can do in the private sector. Well, for, for, the, for the past five or six years, I've been trying to advocate this new movement, but then it can be very challenging to start a new movement. So, so maybe what, star, what starts us in the private sector could actually be supported by the government, by the public, public sector later on. Maybe that's what we could do. For example, the World Rugby Cup, the Rugby World Cup we had. You know, the children think national anthems of the opposing teams, and that's a very inspiring scenery. So, of course, hospitality, omotenashi is wonderful, but one possible of hospitality is to send out the message of peace. So sending out the message of peace, that could be the best form of hospitality. I agree. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So one last one. We, could, we would like to invite one last comment from each of the panelists. So one concluding message. So, so we start with the chairperson. Thank you. Thank you for your most inspiring comments. And as for myself, I'm sorry, I'm speechless. I'm speechless because I, but we have so many wonderful people in the audience today. And it's, it was not coincidence, it was out of sheer need that all of you are here. So when you go back, I hope that you will have, connect, will, I hope that you will have uh, built a new relationship today. That's my ending message. Thank you so much for joining us today. So Mr. Miyagi, your message please. Well, thank you. Once again, I'm grateful for the very kind invitation. And my, and my encounter with Nippon. It was the most memorable event for me. And as I mentioned earlier, I hope that next year we'll be able to leverage next year. And hope that we'll be able to spread the message of ladership and about the gentleness, about the gentle spirit. I hope that we'll be able to use next year to send out such a message to the global scene. I would appreciate your kind cooperation. Thank you. Thank you once again. Well, last but not least, Nippon, your last message, please. First of all, I, I, I just want to thank the Goi Peace Foundation for standing for the values that you stand for. Um, I mean, Hiro himself has so many. I, I was threatening that I, I will ask him questions, but we didn't have time. Uh, but there's so much wisdom in so many people, um, and I think it takes all of us uh, to really create a new sort of energy. And even the ripples just here, as you're thinking while you're in the field of this shared connection, that's happening with all of us every single moment. Um, so I think how do we tap into that? How do we evoke that flow? Whether we're sitting on a meditation cushion or praying, whether we're engaging with a stranger at a coffee shop, whether we are all together in something powerful like this, um, I, I think that invitation to evoke something that's higher, that's greater than the sum of our parts. I think if we just have that consciousness and we see that everyone is a contributor, that everyone is, even now, it may feel like we're on stage and we are sharing thoughts, but at a subtler level, it's actually this incredible exchange that's happening. A and that's what's guiding a lot of what emerges. And so how do we start to really see that we're all contributors, we can all give in multiple forms of capital, and we can all really create a new pattern, a new series of innovations where you have people, even in the private sector, 
like Miyagi-san, who is a, an incredible ladder, you know, to just support a thousand entrepreneurs and then say, I'm still going to be my humble self. I mean, these are the kinds of leaders that we need in, in that world if we're really going to compost and create and innovation. So I think uh, I invite all of us to step into that space in ourselves. We all can't do what he does. We all can't do what Masami-san, of course, does. We can't be heroes, but we can be ourselves. We can dance to that unique song that we're meant to play in the larger symphony. So thank you all for doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we'll conclude the talk session at this juncture. Last but not least, I would like to invite Mr. Kawamura, uh, Maki Kawamura, to talk about uh, the EV little post-it that we asked you to sign earlier. Kawamura-san, please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at the Goy Peace Foundation Forum. Thank you for your kind participation and, and attendance. So happily, we are now celebrating our 20th anniversary. We want to create a future blessed with future. We've been unwavering in this philosophy. And the fact that we've been active for the past 20 years, I'm really proud about our achievements. Why? That is because that many Japanese people are aspiring for peace. They all value peace. It's a, it's a um, illustration of that. And we'd like to thank all of you for, for supporting us for the past 20 years. But then we don't want to be complacent. It's important that going forward, we continue to solicit support from more individuals. Your individual peace can translate into world peace and, the, and happiness for the world. We want to in increase that type of person. And that's the activity which we'd like to pursue going forward. We would like to continue to ask you for your support. Thank you so much. Now, earlier, Nippon, the winner of the Goi Peace Award, repeatedly sent a, mes a, sent a message, act of, a small act of kindness, how small act of kindness can be very important. You think it's easier said than done. You have to deploy your fullest love for the small act of act, for, for the small act. It has to be continued on a daily basis. So it sounds easy. And it might sound as though you can do it immediately, but then there needs to be a lot of passion and feelings incorporated in order to carry out such acts. That's our challenge. And since he's here, and we wanted to connect each small act of kindness so that we can engender social change, we received this message. So we did a small experiment today. So after Nippon's lecture, we gave you a little post-it which was in the form of an apple. We asked you to count your small act of kindness that you did today. And we collected that piece of paper during the break. And during the panel discussion, we actually placed all the post-its on the screen like this. So when you leave, you will find the tree of kindness. And in the tree of kindness, you'll have found the small acts of kindness that all of you have incorporated today. So all the ideas for, for, for social change is incorporated into the tree of kindness. So this is our request to all of you. When you leave, when you go home, please stop by the tree. Please stop by each tree. And please receive one idea of uh, act of kindness that is indicated on the tree. And please reflect your fullest love in, each, in that single act of kindness. I took out one post-it myself. This is th this is it. To wish for the peace of all the people you encounter and send a smile. That when I received this, I thought that's an easy, low-hanging fruit. I thought, but then you need to incorporate your fullest love. If that is the case, you really have to give deep thought about it. And you have to consider how you can wish for the happiness of all the people you encounter and and to smile at the person. That could be quite a serious challenge, I thought. But I want to act on it. Maybe by doing that, maybe we could create a rippling effect. And maybe that could be sustainable, could be passed forward. And then we can have an infinite connection as a result. So 
for those of you familiar with social media, please use hashtag Goi Peace. Please use hashtag Goi Peace. And please use this photo. And also, please share your impressions. We'll be most pleased if you could do that, because that small act of kindness could be passed forward to someone through the media. Maybe you'll be able to share that small act of kindness. Also, the heart pin, the pin-shaped heart. This was created with the fullest of love by Indian women. So it's a message of love from India. We want to spread that. We want to succeed that message of love to people here in Japan. We want to spread that message here in Japan. We are presented with that opportunity. So let us enjoy this moment and continue to create and, and uh, amplify this link and connection. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We show appreciation to all the panelists. We show appreciation to the panelists in the usual fashion, please. Thank you very much. Please give a big round of applause once again to all the panelists. Now, I'd like to ask for uh, the both the chairperson and the president of the Great Peace Foundation for the closing remarks. Well, there's nothing I can say. I feel so grateful and so happy. At the 20th anniversary, to be able to be connected with you, well, the 20 years was not something that would have been realized without you. So thanks to all your support, we were able to come throughout these 20 years. And all those related to us helped us. So we're able to achieve this stage thanks to your help your kindness, your generosity, and your feeling of wanting to help us. So I hope we can reply that to you. So together with you, I'm very happy that we're able to develop this foundation to this stage. Thank you very much. As I mentioned in my opening speech, We had the material and mental support from many one, including in particular our members, and also thanks to your labor, to your work. The volunteers who are providing their support through their work. We have a lot of volunteers, so I want all the volunteers to come here. But to hold such an event. Today we have about 100 volunteers. So we need this much volunteers to help to be able to receive you uh, and provide you comfort and for you to be able to enjoy. We need support of so many people. However, usually our office has only a dozen people. We cannot afford so many people on a daily basis. But whenever needed, so many people gather around us. And that is the ideal of our foundation. So we have so many volunteers, not only today, but for many years we have had their help. So I just thank you all for your help. Thank you very much. For Nippon's activities and Miyagi-san's activities, and also we really recently started the Fuji Declaration 
including six organizations and uh, more than 200 Nobel laureates. We started together with this activity, which is to be able to use the uh, generosity of others, and we want to uh, recreate the awareness that everyone is important. So Nippon, uh, Miyagi-san, and Fuji Declaration, the goodwill of others must be trusted, and that circle should be expanded. That is the basics. This could be misunderstood, but I want to mention that the current egoistic mind seems to be related to populism. Please don't misunderstand me, but these are the top leaders of the world, but I believe our activity is on the entirely opposite side of such activities, but our basic concept is not to reduce what is negative, but to increase what is positive. And by doing so, we believe that will lead to an overall positive world. This year is the 20th anniversary, and we will aim for the next new 10 years or 20 years together with our colleagues. So I hope we can continue to have your cooperation support as well. Thank you very much. This concludes the 2019 Goi Peace Foundation Forum. We hope we can see you again at the next year's forum. Thank you very much for your participation.